Well, hi, uh, my name is Micah Stratton. I'm a master's student in the OIP program. And uh, if I haven't met you, it's, it's nice to meet you this way. I'm gonna present an uh, article, Neural and Cortisol Responses to Acute Psychosocial Stress and Work-Related Burnout as a part of the larger Regensburg Burnout Project. So, to give you an idea of some of the motivation for the study, the Regensburg Project, from what I can tell, uh, is a, a group in a psychiatry department in Germany, and they focus on measuring um, psychobiological responses to burnout, like other chronic stress conditions. Uh, so, uh, and they have identified that the World Health Organization still classifies burnout as a phenomenon. It's not a clinical condition. But at the same time, there are strong correlations or associations with actual physical diseases that are produced by burnout, even though it doesn't have the designation as, as being a disease or a clinical condition. Much of the study in the field um, and in the literature that I have to understand or define the pathophysiology, this link between the phenomenon and the actual diseases, uh, really focuses on the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and its response and how it's affected uh, by the burnout. But this group wants to take that field a little bit step further uh, with their first objective, their first goal. Um, a lot of the research in the field, um, it focuses on cortisol response to measure that HPA axis. Um, and the results that they get are really inconsistent. Sometimes there's no difference in folks with burnout uh, compared to folks who do have burnout. And sometimes it's kind of like a, a blunted or a muted response with cortisol responses, but it's it's pretty varied and it's inconsistent. Um, and, and they feel like one of the reasons that might be possible is because of either a wide heterogeneity of symptom presentation. So just the populations they're studying have all different manner or different kinds of burnout symptoms. Um, or on the other side of that spectrum, that the burnout is so severe that there's kind of like a down regulation to the nervous system response to those symptoms. Uh, so they want to address this issue in the field by being pretty rigorous uh, in how they're selecting their population. They want very clear definition to who has burnout, who doesn't have burnout. And uh, they're, they're looking to pick otherwise healthy workers with subclinical levels of burnout conditions. Their second goal um, is centered around, uh, to the best of my understanding, is a, a paradigm that the group themselves have developed called scan stress. Scan stress is a way to measure acute psychosocial stress uh, while under an MRI. So neural imaging, they're having an MRI and they're measuring neural imaging as it correlates to cortisol, salivary cortisol measurement. So they put people in an MRI, take a look at their brain and their cortisol levels while they experience stress. Um, they're, they're wanting to do this because, uh, again, in the field, there's been shown to have uh, physical change to brain structure due to the experience of burnout conditions, burnout symptoms. And there has not yet been a study where somebody took a look in real time, hey, what is the effect of psychosocial stress in someone with burnout symptoms on these neural structures? So they want to do this uh, by looking at regions of interest in their brain and using this scan stress uh, protocol um, to measure and monitor folks uh, with MRIs. Like we talked about, this is a group that uh, kind of globally studies burnout, and uh, another concept that they want to apply to this is the idea of psychosocial stress time. In a recent study of theirs, they observed deactivation of limbic structures in healthy young men who are experiencing stress conditions, and they felt like they could speculate this might extrapolate to burnout. They might be able to observe this. So their first goal is centered around the hypothesis uh, their second goal here is a little bit uh, exploratory. They want to use this scan stress process, uh, take a look at neural responses, and, and see what they can find. So here's that hypothesis related to the first goal. Um, the hypothesis they stated was that acute psychosocial stress is going to result in a lowered cortisol response in the burnout group as compared to the healthy comparison group. And then um, that more exploratory hey, what are we going to see is happening in real time with neural structures activating 
as we use that uh, sand stress paradigm we've talked about. So as far as the methods, um, they canvassed 1,022 people. I'll just make a quick note. Um, it wasn't clear um, how they contacted these people, whether they had been a part of a previous study or sort of what did your occupation they were from, but that's the number that they gave us. Out of this 1,022 people, 116 meant their pretty stringent burnout criteria and 114 to use. Um, prior to this selection process, they calculated a power analysis of 80, so they met that number nicely. And the exclusion criteria that they mentioned were kind of lumped into three categories. One for the MRI itself, just being in the machine, so pacemakers, uh, pregnancy, things like that. Um, like they mentioned with their population selection, they wanted otherwise healthy people, so no comorbidities, um, chronic health conditions, use of corticosteroids or uh, anticoagulants. And then they wanted them to be in the workforce, working greater than 20 hours a week, not in the middle of a long absence. They wanted to be actively working. These participants were paid, um, and they went through appropriate channels with uh, like ethics review boards and uh, informed consent with the participants themselves. So the first table we're looking at here um, is really just to show that these are the values the group selected um, as to whether they would participants would be in a burnout group or a healthy comparison group. And what's important here is that they were using measurements that are uh, appropriate in study, like they're relevant in the field of burnout, the math like burnout inventory, um, effort reward and balance questionnaire, and uh, also the like hospital anxiety depression scale. Uh, what's kind of a note is uh, this one right here. They interviewed the participants themselves as well as their colleagues, their peers, to say, hey, what was this person's motivation or, or professional aptitude like before they developed burnout? You know, was this person sort of always, um, you know, apathetic or uh, they made an effort to control for sort of like a, an overall um, character assessment uh, when they were selecting their population? This is the procedure that the participants went through themselves, and um, we're going to take a, a few minutes and, and look at some of the, some of the ways they approached getting the information that they got. So, uh, once they met criteria and were selected for the population, they had their first appointment. A lot of questionnaires on stress levels, work related stress, um, lifestyle things, the symptomologies that they were having. And the best that I could find um, outside of this study on the group's website, their allostatic load parameters involved a blood sample measuring for like physiological markers of, of stress load, and then a hair sample for uh, cortisol levels. Um, also to note in this first appointment, uh, they attempted to control uh, for menstrual cycles in female participants by using urine test strips so that they could be scheduled for their procedure uh, at a time when their menstrual cycle would be less likely to affect HPA access function. Uh, so that was done at this first appointment. Um, within the same week of this first appointment, participants would show up for the scan stress paradigm. And that's what we're looking at here um, in this image. So the big thing to note uh, with how they were tested was at 10 different points, which we see with these squares and these little vials, they were tested 10 different times throughout um, the time block for their positive and negative affective score, basically what their mood is, how they're feeling, and salivary cortisol. So 10 times they're being sampled uh, throughout the whole test for that. They come in, spend about 45 minutes watching what they refer to as a neutral movie, so kind of a relaxing point. And then they're administered 75 grams of glucose in an effort to control for dietary intake confounders. Maybe they want to make sure everyone has plenty of glucose in their system to have like a nervous system response. They get some logistical um, instructions. And then these gray blocks here is when they're actually in the MRI. So uh, when they go in, uh, they, have, they get an additional heart rate monitor here, and it's randomized which block you get first. There's two blocks, a control block and a stress block. Um, it's, there's a panel of people in the room while they're in the MRI, and they're administering questions. Hey, here's a basic math problem. So for the control block, the questions are easy. There's no time constraints. Regardless of which block you get first, in between them, 
the panel gives you a lot of negative feedback. Hey, you really didn't do that great. Please go quicker. We got to get this test done. Be better in the next in the next block. And then um, the stress block is very difficult, complex questions that you're given time constraints you don't have time to answer. And that was the group's way of implementing psychosocial stress, testing cortisol, and looking for the neurological changes there. Uh, at the end, there's a few more questionnaires and some debriefing. But the second appointment, the same procedure, is repeated seven months later for one and three. And they're looking at the, the difference in time. Um, so, and there's also the allostatic load parameter and hair sample repeated. That's how they collected their information. And then let's take a quick look at how they analyzed it. So um, for most of the raw data, it was a repeated measures ANOVA. And they did use a univariate regression for a few of the, the variables, um, like demographic things. Uh, the neural imaging values and data themselves, they use a, a, a non-parametric test called randomized. And I have just a few notes here. Um, they did end up taking the values from an MRI and exported them to SPSS so that they could look for changes in some of the activity in the neural structures. All of the cortisol data um, was measured in a, a specific way. It, had, it, wasn't, it was these specific time points um, from when they were in the MRI. And then the sort of like the biophysical data um, they had it log transformed before using the repeated measure of ANOVA. Uh, and then interestingly, they had a cutoff value for cortisol response, like amount of cortisol response, to lump all participants into either you did have a cortisol response, you were a responder, or you were not a responder. So that's how they kind of took a look at that data. And uh, let's get into the <laughs> results and some of their tables and figures. So this study, um, they accepted their null hypothesis. They didn't see what they had planned or thought that they were going to see. Um, there was no difference in response, uh, cortisol response, between the burnout group and the health control group. And there was no difference in um, like neurological activity between the two groups. Um, several of their results kind of gravitate around maybe trying to show that scan stresses a uh, product or a program that does uh, cause acute stress, um, neurological acute stress. Um, and that's where they're really focusing on the heart rate elevations during the different blocks of MRIs and the positive and negative affect scores um, here. So let's look at what their information looks like. In this table, they're presenting their demographics. And a lot of this is the results of the questionnaires in that first appointment um, during the procedure. And I think uh, one of the things to note with this graphic is just, again, um, they were measuring a lot of, um, a lot of symptoms and a, a lot of components uh, that are appropriate in the field of burnout that are they're relevant to the field of burnout. Uh, these are sort of like their raw data. And the first one is cortisol. Uh, these great columns here indicate when the stand stress uh, MRI was actually happening. So this is showing that both groups are, you know, they're having increased uh, response to cortisol. Um, here's their heart rate measurements. And like we discussed in the previous slide, the heart rate and the positive affective and the negative affective scores. They're saying that uh, since the positive affective scores went down throughout the testing, and the negative affective scores went up, as well as heart rates being high during the stress blocks and then recovering during the control blocks. They're really presenting a lot of their data uh, in regards to the effectiveness of the scan stress uh, paradigm. Um, and that's, that's mostly what we see here. Um, the one takeaway that they were able to have in the discussion uh, is, is, is shown here, and we'll look at this one. So, uh, this is saying the, these are the areas of the brain that they saw have stress activity in the whole population in both groups. And this is where they sort of said, you know, there was no difference. We had to um, sort of accept that null hypothesis. But what they did see, um, and it's related to a concept they developed in another paper called uh, psychosocial stress time, is that over time, there was very opposite reactions. So in the first run, the first test, 
there was a lower response in this red burnout group. And then compare it to seven months later in the second run, they had an overall higher stress response, which was the negative or the opposite reaction of the healthy comparison group. And that's what we're looking at here in this middle group. They're saying that that difference in stress reaction occurred in these areas of the brain they were able to identify. And interestingly enough, one of these areas, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, uh, has a relationship with the amygdala, other limbic structures, and it's been identified as possibly an area to look at in the future um, as a, I uh, can't say causal, but you know, might increase the pathophysiological explanation of burnout to actual physical disease. So a few uh, positives and negatives. Um, I felt like it was a pretty rigorous design and some careful control for confounders. Um, they did use lots of validated tests to kind of support some exploratory or new ideas. And they were able to give some great discussion as to how and why they accepted an all hypothesis. They talked about things like, you know, they, they, they looked at subclinical presentation of burnout. And so maybe it's in that more severe or advanced presentation that you're going to see reduced cortisol levels or different neural activities. Um, and then some things um, that can maybe be explored more um, was describing you know, what the population looks like in terms of occupation. Um, maybe having some uh, more categories or some more in that population of severe symptoms. Um, and then, you know, if maybe there's more discussion about scan stress, like if this, if this article was more about um, trying to vet or validate that process, like maybe just come out and talk about it. And then I wasn't quite sure about the glucose administration. Maybe that could be a confounder itself to um, right through the, the testing. Um, so, uh, yeah, if uh, there's any questions, it seems like now would probably be the right time. How do you control for people just not? Lagging to be inside an MRI machine. Like, I would do it if someone was paying me to do it, but uh, I'd probably get pretty stressed out. Yeah. So how did they? How did they find people that? I guess maybe there are people in the world that can get an MRI without getting stressed out. Uh, but how did they find? I guess how did they control for that, or did they consider that in their selection process? Uh, it wasn't discussed. Uh, I could speculate about how they might analyze that, but I'm not sure what anyone here wants to wants to hear that um but you know because they have those sort of defined um time points for measuring cortisol um so like you can see when they get in here it's like every 15 minutes and and they they have a couple of measurements beforehand so you can see exactly like what you said the averages are showing that cortisol is already going up as the, the mri is starting so I don't know if that's something in your data analysis you go back and take a look at those big outliers and see how much it's affecting it or, or something like that. But that it? Anything else? So just as a part of the design, <laughs> Is run, am I getting this right? Run one is not under stress, and then run two is stress. Uh, those are the two, um, those are the two separate tests or appointments. So, um, what they call run one, um, you're doing this full MRI protocol, and then run two is seven months in the future, you're doing the whole thing again, plus giving a hair sample and the. <clears throat> Okay. Static, but are they doing, they're doing for each participant, they're experiencing a non stressful state in the FF, fMRI machine mm -hmm. and then a stressful state at the, okay. Gotcha. I guess on the glucose, is they're trying to make sure somebody doesn't end up in uh, obviously a reaction on the low side, right? When your body's like revving up to say, start producing glucose because your brain has to survive on glucose. So I, 
I don't know. I'm just guessing that there's something there. Cortisol as well. It would for sure. So, um, what do you think of the, the uh, intervention or the testing scenario and how maybe not everybody reacts the same way? Yeah, and that's where it wasn't quite as clear. Um, in their discussion, they were pretty quick to talk about, you know, oh, we saw this heart rate variability that was consistent for the whole group and everything. It, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if they were trying to establish the scan stress of saying, like, yeah, this is a, a good way to test for stress or not. Um, and that's why I included it in the discussion because, you know, if that's the case, I would have, I would have loved to read more about um, exactly like what you asked. You know, how do you, how do you control for that? that uh, human level range of reactivity. First complimented you on a complex topic of doing this presentation. Thanks. Um, the, so if you want to measure the, the lowest heart rate for a surgeon, it occurs when in the operating room. That's when they're comfortable. And what I'm getting at is that it's <laughs> But me, if somebody put me through this, I'd probably get entertained now. You know, because I could tell right away they're trying to gain the thing and push me into it, and I can't do it. And I'm like, oh, that is a pile of crap. You know, just get entertainment out of it. Other people get stressed. You see what I mean? And I, I'm just kind of wondering if the problems may include who got into the protocol and what their baseline. I'm, you know, this is, there's an expert over on that side of the room, so I'm gonna find you. But mm -hmm. you know, I, I think there's a psychological makeup thing. How we perceive stress is such an important variable here that I don't, and if, and if you end up with that not controlled, I would imagine you end up with mush for data. I mean, it's a good first try, but I, I don't. Oh. Yeah, so one of the, you know, <clears throat> Along those lines, you know, you look at their inclusion exclusion criteria and their comparison groups, and they have a, they draw a line at one point five mm -hmm. for the score on burnout, right? Um, and they have the healthy group as people who are you know less than that, and the burnout group as people who are more than that. Well, the issue here is that they're making comparison of these folks are burned out, these people are not. But what's a one point four nine compared to a one point five one? Yeah, right. And so the way that they approached this, they found some, inter you know, some meaningful differences, I think. Um, but to really compare a group that are truly burned out and a group that are truly healthy, you'd actually want that to be, you know, that spread to be pulled apart a bit, right? Because um, I don't, uh, I, I'm just trying to find to see whether or not they looked at how many of the people within their sample are within plus or minus, you know, point 0.1. You know, how, how many are clubs around that middle point versus... Mm -hmm in the you know actually burned out and actually healthy right based on that 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 particular scale right so this so i guess the question would be for me you know what do you think they could have done into in terms of their inclusion exclusion criteria to ensure that they're actually comparing the, the groups that they're that they've labeled them what do you what do you think or what do you guys think is might be done to help with that I mean, when I was putting this together, I, it surprised me that they wanted to include people who had, because I think the words they used, they, they, the healthy comparison group included um, low levels of burnout. And I was just like, why would you have it be any burnout at all? Why wouldn't it be a, a more, like a more stark comparison? Yeah. 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 Because they went to such efforts to define uh -huh. that subclinical, you know, all this kind of rigorous definition to it, but then still included people who, uh, but yeah. Yeah, and they didn't put, a, oh, go ahead, Chapman. Well, I was gonna say you would, you could bracket it on either mm -hmm. side a little bit tighter, but yeah. the problem is it looked like they assessed, what was it, over 1,100 people, 1,100 yeah. volunteers, and they only got 60. Yeah, they, had, they did power analysis, and so they were trying to fit within their power yeah. analysis, and you know, you look, and, and so I'm guessing their inclusion, exclusion criteria, um, may have adjusted here and there to to include us the right number of people for their power analysis, which I think is you know 
is a bit of a problem, right? You want to determine your inclusion exclusion criteria and then assess as many people as you need to, to be able to include or exclude your groups. So that way you can make the comparisons you want. So I think, but that, you know, if that, if that meant they had to uh, then, you know, assess another thousand people, that's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of time and that's a lot of probably money. Um, and so I think there's a balancing act whenever you're doing research about how to, how to do that. But I do think that the comparison groups, I'm glad they found some interesting things, but I don't, I don't like the labels of the comparison groups because it, it seems like you, the healthy group is not as healthy as it probably should be to be tr called the healthy group. Mm -hmm. And the burnout group is probably not quite as burned out as it needs to be to be truly a burned out group, at least for everybody in those groups. Yeah, and they they spent some good time discussing that, um, but only yeah. at, at the burnout group. They didn't sort of identify that issue with the control group. Yep. Anyway. So would that indicate, but if, if if these results indicate anything, would it show that burnout is more heavily related to chronic stress over acute any form of acute stress? Is that essentially well? Burnout is a chronic condition, right? So yeah, it should be related more to um, chronic issues than to acute. But I think for me, the the bigger issue is whether or not you truly have a burnout group versus a a non burned out group. Um, in this case, and that's what they're that's what they're basing their comparisons off of, but they may not actually have that in this case. And then you have all the perceptual issues associated with it, you know where right. what you know Kurt was getting at. Why my perception of burnout? I may feel burned out, but someone in my same situation might be like, "Suck it up," you know. You're not. Why are you burned out? You know, there's no reason for that. Doesn't matter whether there's a reason or not. <laughs> if the person is feeling that, they're going to behave in a certain way, right? So, anyway. Right. <laughs> it's also probably pretty much the analysis driven by their outliers. What's they're going to? No, that in the paper, which yeah, it's already you work on that scale. Oh, yeah, okay. Awesome. So, I'm Emma Monte, I'm an industrial hygiene master's student, and the article I chose is called Students Music Exposure. Whole day personal dose measure. This is in reference to noise and not radiation. They didn't specify that. Um, this is a little so less refined than that last article. <laughs> so we can go into that later. <laughs> so it was written in 2016 and published by Noise and Health. So an actual, you know, noise. Um, they knew what noise was and they published this. Uh, I chose this because. I personally was on drumline in high school and I lost, I have probably pretty bad hearing because of that. And so I've always been curious to see if I would have worn hearing protection, if that would have made a difference or not. Because like, uh, I was doing drumline for six plus hours a day, so you never know. But anyway, moving on, uh, going through what I'll be talking about, we'll discuss the purpose, go through some background elements of it. Uh, go through their methods, see the results, and then hopefully have a little conversation afterwards. So the purpose that they said, and I quote, the purpose of the study was to determine the full day exposure dose, including individual practice and ensemble rehearsals for collegiate student musicians. Um, again, dose is noise. Um, so a lot of the previous studies have been done in this area have been with professional musicians and not student um, musicians and so they didn't state their hypothesis uh, which can go into their limitations or a weakness of this study uh, but i assume that since they were um they mentioned professional musicians that they think that student musicians will be exposed to less noise than that uh, but again they didn't state their hypothesis 
Um, so some background, noise is essentially um, vibrations through the air. Uh, sound is vibrations through the air. Noise is the same thing except unwanted. And so um, it's measured in decibels. And in this study, they did um, use an A-weighted scale. So that's why the A comes in, uh, DBA. A-weighted is good because it's um, most applicable to human hearing and compared to B or C-weighted. Uh, so for reference, these are just some typical sound levels and DBA um, or decibels. So in a silent study room is about 20 decibels, uh, classroom chatter is about 70. Uh, and filling up, a jet taking off if you're standing 200 feet away, it's about 130 decibels. And then the point of pain is at 140 decibels. OSHA likes you to be um, at 95 is the P, or sorry, at 90 is the PEL and 85 is the action level. So that's usually where um, things start to happen in industry. <laughs> Uh, looking at more into the ear, uh, I'm not an Ocred student, so forgive me if I say anything incorrect, but sound travels through um, the ear canal, hits the eardrum, passes through the middle ear, and then essentially goes to the cochlea. And in the cochlea, there are hairs, and um, when you're exposed to a loud noise, those hairs lie flat, and then usually will recover after you're out of that sound effect. So um, after you're exposed to a lot of loud noises over a long period of time, those hairs get tired, they get damaged, and that's where permanent hearing damage comes into. So um, we're usually, in IH, uh, we're usually concerned with long-term damage in the cochlea with those hairs. Um, but in this study, they really focused on the temporary. So when those hairs lie flat for a little bit, but then when they do recover, that's what they decided to focus on, even though that's again temporary. Uh, we call it temporary depression and shift. So it's not permanent. Um, so I thought that was another interesting point that they decided to focus on that instead of the permanent hearing damage that can come from long term um, noise exposure. This is looking more at the cochlea. Um, this is a healthy, these are healthy hairs. You can see most of them all the way in. And then on this one, you can see there's little bit of some gaps. And so. That's permanent, and you can't recover from that. So looking at noise standards that they use in this particular study, they use the NIOSH REL, or recommended exposure limit, which is at 85. The exchange rate there is three decibels, and OSHA's it, their permissible exposure limit is 90 decibels with an exchange rate of five decibels. So NIOSH is typically more conservative, more protective to the, the worker or musician in this case. Um, and the exchange rate is when, I'm going to call it the three slide. Essentially, if you're exposed, we'll go with the NIOSH one. If you're exposed to 90 decibels, and then that increases to 93 decibels, your exposure time or the time you spend in that environment needs to decrease by half. So if you spend in, uh, six hours and um, 90, and then it increases to 93, then you have to then spend three hours in the environment. So NIOSH is definitely more conservative and more protective, like I said. They also used noise dose. Instead of just giving the decibels, they used the noise dose, which is the actual time the, the person spent in that environment over the allowed time. But the allowed time is determined by uh, NIOSH or OSHA, and that's a criterion level that they deal with. So I, I usually deal with just straight decibels. That's what the workplace uses. So I think it was interesting that they decided to use noise dose because uh, that's not a normal, at least to me, that's not a normal thing to do. So then looking at the musicians themselves, the students, 67 college students applied between the ages of 18 to 25. They were from the School of Music not sure which school of music, but just the school of music, um, majoring in classical music, um, specific area. They took um, 17 primary instruments, and at the end of the study, they had to exclude 10 because those 10 didn't complete the full two days of sampling. So there was 57 students who actually completed the full two days, and they had the students complete um, a schedule, a log sheet, just saying what their um, classes were, what they were doing during those times, which I think is uh, 
really valuable to do when you're doing your own studies. Uh, their schedules included individual, small, large ensemble rehearsals, and then individual practice sessions, and then breaks and coursework. These are the instruments that they pulled from. So in my opinion, it's a good spread. Percussionist seven, so good representation for percussionists. Um, and 13 is the most with voice students. And we had a bass trombone, just one bass trombone. So, you know, there's representation in all instruments, but there could have been probably stronger representation on some of them. Moving on to the methods, so again, it was two days of just normal music activities, their normal schedule. Um, Monday and Tuesday, it was, the samples were from about seven to nine hours, which is typical to the industry side of things. You're trying to get at least an eight-hour sample. So um, that was good. They used the serious nose badge, noise to some loose, and they put them directly onto the musician about 10 to 12 centimeters from the ear, which is also typical. Students reported their schedules again, and from their schedules, the researchers decided to divide it up into large ensemble rehearsals and then the individual practice sessions. So looking at the results, so 49% exceeded the 100% daily noise dose on at least one day. And that is like so confusing for some reason how they phrased that, but essentially 49% of them were over exposed to noise on at least one day. 11 students were overexposed on both of the days, and then most of the experiences that occurred were during the large ensemble rehears rehearsals, which makes sense, right? There's more instruments, there's more people, more sound waves going on. Um, so that's just like, they did very basic statistics. Uh, like, I couldn't even understand it, it was that basic, so. Um, Looking at the figures that they attached, this is the daily noise dose by instruments just in general who exceeded. So as you can see, um, the saxophone, I don't know what he was doing, but it was at 700%. Um, and then the second one, this trumpet. Uh, so you know the personalities of those instruments, that makes sense. But um, so again, those are pretty high exceedances, uh, but these are just overall. Looking at their next one, um, the highest, these are with noise dose exceedances during the ensemble sessions, the larger groups. And the highest exposure there was the trumpet around, you know, 460. And then figure two is looking at uh, noise dose of student musicians during individual practices, which surprisingly was uh, the voice students. And they did comment on this in the research, they stated that it might have been because the voice students are in smaller rooms, uh, there's more energy in the sound waves there because they're bouncing directly, just like right there, and there's a pianist in the room, which also is very powerful in a small setting. So that was the reasoning behind it, which seems valid to me. So from this data that they collected, they suggested that students should be inputted into a hearing protection program, which is interesting. Uh, hearing, uh, hearing conservation programs can be very complicated. They can also not be, but they usually are. Um, they have three main parts. You have to wear hearing protection in a certain, that certain environment that's loud or during a certain procedure. Um, they also have to get an annual audiology exam, which is when they have to go into the audiologist and um, every year. And then they get a test to see if their hearing has decreased between that year time. And then they also have to be inputted in a training program where they're taught you know, what is hearing protection, how do you take care of it, what is hearing loss. Uh, so that seems, in my opinion, pretty intense for student musicians. Uh, but again, I lost hearing because of it. <laughs> Here we are. Um, so going more into the strengths and weaknesses of this uh, research. I think some strengths is they're, they have representation from a good amount of instruments, which is important. Um, and this area had pretty little research in it. Again, it was mainly professional musicians that they were focusing on in other research projects. And so I think it was interesting that they did seek this out with the students, because again, this is you know their, their full-time job. 
Um, and I think this is a baseline and they have ample opportunity to do more with this area of research. Data limitations, um, variations in instruments, there are different uh, uh, basically every instrument there's going to be trumpets are just naturally more loud than flutes that's just the nature of the instrument and so that can be a huge uh, variation in the study that they didn't control for at all um, they can tamper with the sample uh, I've seen it when I sample all the time of it is interesting to wear a dosimeter. Most people don't know what they are, and so they, they try and make it louder to see the levels go up on it, um, which is valid, but also skews the data. So that saxophone, I will bet 10 bucks on that that he was doing. Um, exceedances during lunch. There was a, one, I believe it was a trumpet. He was exceed, had an over exceedance during lunch, and so they didn't control for that, which again, like that is their exposure limit. They were exposed to that noise, and that can relate to the hearing loss, but, you know. Uh, selections of pieces, pieces obviously, there's some quiet, some loud, uh, that they didn't account for that. Um, seating placement, if you're seated in front of a trumpet or next to a trumpet, that can be louder uh, technique that you're using at the time. And then again, I've mentioned this earlier, the, the temporary threshold shift, I thought was an interesting emphasis that they, this is the problem that they wanted to solve instead of permanent hearing damage. Um, and they didn't really account for any of like outside noises if they're listening to music on their headphones or anything like that. That can also, you know, increase your noise exposure. So kind of going more into the discussion part of things, I only put three strings, which is probably not that good. But did y'all see any other strings in this study to start on a positive note? Anything? And if not, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, we can move on. Um, statistical analysis, I think, would have been a pretty weak point, but again, yeah, anyway. Uh, would there be a, any other analysis y'all would have done with this study? Um, what do you prefer to see with it? Well, they did relatively simple analyses, but they also had a fairly small sample. So a smaller sample, it's really hard to do more sophisticated analyses. Yeah. So given how many uh, college students there are in music and just one large, you know, university, it seems like they didn't get a lot. The sample's pretty small, yeah. right? Um, which, you know, if the sample was larger, I'd feel more comfortable with the conclusions they're drawing, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. I guess a question for... <clears throat> For you or for everyone would be, um, how do you know? How do they balance the need for exposure or reduction, right, with the need under that job, if you want to call you know, prefer, you know playing an instrument a job, which it is for some, um, or performing you know music, um, the need to be able to hear the other players, the other parts, the other things, so that way the music comes together and is balanced and it does what it's supposed to do, right? Um, how do we, how do we, how do they, man, you know, manage that? Yeah, that's a valid point. I can comment on that. Again, my mom every day in high school is like, you should be wearing earplugs. You should be wearing earplugs. I'm like, well, then I can't hear the guy next to me and then we'll be clean. And that's the whole point of being, you know? Yeah. So I totally get that point of, yeah, if you put earplugs or head or earplugs in, you won't be able to hear the person next to you normally. If it's more sophisticated, yeah, you probably could, but normally not. I think that goes into the hierarchy of controls, though, where you can't eliminate music because that would just be sad. You can't <laughs> it, but you can do engineered controls. Yeah. Um, in practice rooms and in rehearsal halls, obviously that is very sound engineered. Um, and I think that is a valid uh, way to control this, but you can do admin controls, but not really, like you need to practice so that you can't do shift, shift work with that. Um, so yeah, I would think the main way of doing it is engineering controls. Uh, any other thoughts on that sort of question? Yeah, yeah on the... In the sphere of the engineering controls, there's um, a lot of common use of earplugs that have cartridges that can filter certain amount of decibels out. So it really helps get a 
uh, a clean reduction instead of like a broad spectrum reduction. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that sounds like maybe that would have been a part of the program that they recommended. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, they honestly didn't go much and like they wanted to do a hearing protection program, but they didn't go into which uh, earplugs they wanted to use, how sophisticated it would be. So that's, yeah, that'd be interesting if you could just zone out certain decibels or whatever. Yeah, put a hand over here. Yeah. So I think a hearing protection program for a musical setting would be very different just for different instruments. Yeah. Piano player majors, they're practicing seven, eight, nine hours every day. Mm -hmm. Voice people, they're down to more like three, maybe. Right. Most practice rooms I've seen have been closets, pretty small. Other areas might not be so small. Every instrument, and even yet a specific university, you're going to see different requirements. Yeah, no, that's, that's valid. I Relating that to industry, you can do similar exposure groups, SEGs. Um, they do that with you know, certain procedures. If you're doing this procedure, then you'll be in the hearing protection program. And so it would be similar. If you're in this instrument group, you could be in the program, uh, something similar to that. So that's a good point. Not everyone in the band needs to be in it necessarily. Did you have another comment? Yeah. So kind of returning to the sample size and choice of method issue. Um, since they looked at a whole bunch of different types of instruments, the variance on that exposure is so wide, right? Um, and so a lot of times you can get away with inferential statistics with smaller sample sizes, as long as there's like less variance in that treatment. And so I think that they probably, I would guess, tried that and saw nothing because the variance among all of these things is so great, you're not gonna be able to identify a significant effect. Right. No, that's a valid question for sure. There's a lot of variation in this. It's, it's all over the place. So I think more data, like more uh, every week or for one week or something, nice to have more. And and along these lines, I would have liked to have seen plots that actually included the students that didn't exceed thresholds too. Like they only included yeah. the ones that, that exceeded the threshold, which seemed a bit strange to me. Yeah, like what were they doing that was different? Or yeah, that would have been a great point. There's a lot of great points that they. <sighs> Um, I feel like in a perfect world with all the time and all the money, the what I would have liked to seen is following students over their four years and do audiometric testing yeah. every six months. Because I feel like that would have for sure showed the students that if they're losing hearing. And also I feel like it would have been effective to for because the students are gonna be playing their whole life. And so if they are seeing loss of hearing, that's gonna scare them. Mm -hmm. And so that might make them explore other options of hearing protection. No, and so I think that that this uh, that, that would be a lot more money and that would have to have professors involved or PhD students do it for that long. But I think that would be the best course of action. Yeah, no, I was along, thinking along the same lines of if they did audiograms, it would show if they are having that threshold shift, if they are losing hearing. Yeah, if you did it, you know, three months, six months throughout their whole college career, that would be great data, honestly. And then they could take that information and decide for themselves if they want to wear hearing protection or if they don't. Yeah, because I mean, we could go through a list of all the different things that are wrong with the study, and there's lots of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but we've, we, we do that pretty regularly in here. But what I think is interesting about this is that even though it had a lot of problems, there were some a few findings in there that, that led even us to think about you know, what would a randomized controlled trial look like where we actually follow people over time and the both that were underexposed and overexposed when it comes to the actual decibel you know, exposure in their music uh, career and so forth. And so I think that's helping us realize, okay, this wasn't a great study, but it got published and it's helping people who may be curious enough to do more with it, think about what would be the right way to do it. And I think that's that's one of the goals of Journal Club is doing exactly that, seeing the flaws, but also seeing the potential. No, yeah, I agree. And that's some of my strengths were just that, like this is a great, it's bringing attention to this area of study that is not normally studied. Um, so hopefully more research will go into this that might be a little more formal. Outside of this study, in the background, did you find out anything about what population-based studies have been done on other musicians over time? I mean, I could imagine 
the aging rock star kind of a scenario. Of yeah, that's that's been the most common one that I found. It's that that's a professional musician too, right? They yeah. uh, tour, they do it every day. Um, so that's that's where I found most of my research was in rock, um, old rock stars, well, aged rock stars. <laughs> however you say that correctly. Um, and so experience. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, that's where most of it is at, and very little is done in the collegiate level area. So. Is it known? I mean, is it as um, significant as my intuition would suggest that old mu older musicians have audiometric evidence of hearing loss, noise related hearing loss? I mean, just in general, the general population, right? If you get older, those hair cells are going to be more old, damaged, gone, and so that's why that's just essentially the reason why. Um, more experienced people uh, can't hear as well. So I would assume it'd be the same with musicians who are also more experienced. Uh, so yeah, I, I would think it's more well known. <laughs> <laughs> Was there another hand up? Yeah. It might be interesting to know if the music they're listening to in their car is worse than the music that they're playing. Yeah, no, and if they didn't, they didn't ask they only asked their schedule during those eight hours, just nine hours. They never talked about if they went to a concert that night that was at 110 decibels or, you know, that wouldn't have gone into the study, but, or if they listen, yeah, to the radio really loud or whatever. So there's a lot of variation in that. When was the study done again? 2011. Okay. This one this was published, right? Oh, 16. Sorry, I'm just making oh. up numbers. I was going to say, because when I, when I used to play violin, I would play back recordings of people that were way better than me yeah. but really loud okay. so that I could hear everything and then but I mean that's you know back then <laughs> headphones like I'm sure I did permanent damage listening with like the type of Apple headphones that were connected to your iPod back yeah, in the day yeah. now and just like there's no control of so that's more recent than probably what would be concerning but no. at least in my practice that was like pretty regular I'm sure that had a pretty severe impact <laughs> Metronome alone, I know that it, it, it would be blaring in my ear all the time. Like, that alone is like painful. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of variation, a lot of factors that can go into musicians and their noise exposure. I think it's a cool area of study um, just because I think a lot of us do play music uh, or play instruments. So, you know, any last comments before we close? Any idea if, if or why? Um, Impact of the same level of noise would be different in older people and younger people. If the same level of noise would impact the older older people, younger. older musicians than younger ones. Um. Well, they don't like it would be more damaging. Why? To the younger ones because they have more healthier health care cells. To, is that right? I'm not sure. So, we're going to make a hypothesis of the other way around. Um, there are three large prospective cohort studies demonstrating that cardiovascular disease risk factors are rather robust risks for development of hearing loss. So you hypothesis, I think, that the resiliency issue and the recovery issues are going to be better in the younger than the older ones. So to Dr. Wood's point, you'd expect the older, you know, dying off 75-year-old rock musicians to have some interesting audiograms. Yeah. versus what they would have had as a as a 20 or 25 year old. The other comment I would make is the, uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, way back in the 1970s, I can tell you sound uh, uh, absorbing materials were used in all the practice rooms, uh, orchestra and the band rooms. So it's already in place at that time. At least it was where I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not like, yeah. One of the considerations when we designed this room, that's why this uh, material is at the back of the wall. Right. The question was, should we put it also along the sides? And and we could have spent 100 k to get a formal um, acoustic study. And the um, the uh, decision making was it's not worth 100 k. We'll just gamble. So. <laughs> so <laughs> 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 yep.